Greetings ladies and mental gents and welcome to my channel, where I like to make audio narrations of stories from across the internet. In this series, we'll be focusing on a web novel called There Is No Epic Lucha, Only Puns, from the website Royal Road. And in this video, we'll be doing chapter 100 to 102. I hope that you enjoy. There is no epic lucha, only puns. Chapter 100. Delta. They hovered over the moon. It could be called a moon when it was inside the earth. Was it a core? And a giant core of all the world? Delta honestly didn't know. Don't look so glum. I'm just holding you here until Sister's frazzled nerves settle down and you get beamed back to Sister's ship. The brother announced as he kicked back and they both moved to a large tunnel directly below the core. It should have taken days or more to travel the length of the core, but brother just made them appear where he wanted. You're a bit more coherent than sis, why is that? Delta chose to ask instead. Indeed, the brother before her while sis seemed to be behind many layers of the metaphysical barrier. Brother waved a hand and Delta watched as a long, simple bamboo pole with a long wire at the end appeared. A glinted hook glimmering before Brother flicked it down into the dark tunnel. Sis is a nerd. She builds systems, projects, and handles the delicate nature of things. Me, I'm more of a nature kind of lad. He grinned and gestured not quite at the right for a human. His rod tugged and Brother pulled out a wire, needing no reel. He pulled out something that hurt to look at. It squirmed and tried to move in dimensions that screamed. Brother took a bite out of it and hummed. I call them Yerotots. Tastes like radioactive sushi, he grinned, teeth covered in dark slime. He used a simple white sleeve to wipe his teeth. He gestured to the rod. Go on, have some fun, he urged. Data gingerly took the thing and cast the hook down into the tunnel. It felt so weird to do so. Hold something. I eat things, and you can say that I learn things from the things that I don't eat, and sometimes from what I do eat. I once fished up a copy of an atlas, where everything just read, Dead Zone. Sometimes I fish out discs or souls, like you. He reclined back on the empty space and closed his eyes. Like dungeons, you eat things and learn. Delta said quickly, and the rod still in her hands. Brother grinned. There is a good reason most dungeons are in my body and not floating around like cysts. Dungeons are like the... One of the few things me and my sister work together on. He picked up his nose and then licked it. Delta shuddered at the sheer rudeness. You've been told that the eye is yet. Not sure on how on top of sister's info sharing. I don't get three hoots or boots or coots or oops, but foreshadowing. I fish those up every day. He snorted to himself. Delta shook her head and brother held out a hand and a copy of the core behind him appeared in his hand as a ghostly copy. No biggie, I guess. I owe you for not screaming at me or whatever. I guess I'm happy you made it underground and got on all right. Brother said as if this was nothing important. So, there was once a very handsome and attractive brother and all the existing beings wanted him at the time. Then there was a spacey sister who walked into walls, still cute, and she's still my sister, but obviously I got a good half of creation, he preened. I feel like this tale has hints of biases in it, Delta said dryly. Her fear of the being before her seemed to ebb with every second that he didn't hurt her or take her name away. One day we decided that we were kind of bored to play two-player mode and wanted a little sibling. Now, since me and Sis had neither done any research into the subject, nor decided to start small, we forced together a being from leftover parts of creation. Let me tell you, you physical people have it so easy. You just jump into the hay together, and a year later, boom, sprogs. Brother waved a hand and exasperated, and he began tossing the core in his hand and catching it as he spoke. Well, of course, it went perfectly, he nodded, Delta blinked. Perfectly wrong, I mean. He corrected himself. He began to slowly turn in the air. We got the right amount of power. Intent idea. But this little guy was lacking something. Don't know exactly what it was. But let's just say that if he were a piece of bread, he came out of the oven with fangs and enough hunger to try and eat us right on the spot. Brother grimaced. He was just all wrong. Well, not wrong. He just wasn't perfect like me. He kind of had a bit of me and sis in him, so he had a bit more power than we intended. 
No, I ain't the jealous type. I don't mind sharing my toys, but he wanted to break them and eat them, and then vomit them back up just to spite us. Brother turned the giant glowing eye behind him. What would have happened if he had eaten you? Delta whispered. Brother shot him a look. Let me just check my, uh, higher being manual. Mm hmm, yeah. The page for digesting by your artificial sibling seems to be missing. Oh no. He mocked, gasped. Delta narrowed her eyes. I'd smack you if I knew you wouldn't set me on fire for it. She warned. Brother seemed to enjoy that blunt honesty. I guess he gets two slices of pie and becomes the one true being. Wonder how that would have turned out. Oh well. But the good news is that he was kind of dumb as a rock. Like, I feel more shame in how dumb he was than the whole trying to eat us thing. Brother grinned. You've taken screwing up to creation and creating a monster rather well, Delta said. The boy shrugged once more. We were lonely kids. I don't mean to act like I wasn't bad, but we have feelings too, he reminded. Delta tried to moving the fishing rod, but nothing seemed to bite just yet. So we pretended not to mind the attempts to eat us and acted like we all had a great idea. A game of hide and seek. If it won, it could eat us, and if it lost, well... Another day to try and get us. Brother hummed. He nodded at the shocked look. Dumber than a rock, and this was before there were rocks. He grinned. So we told it closed its eyes and count, until it got bored. When it closed its eyes, well, I'll skip the gruesome part, but we took an eye each. The eyes hold a lot of power, and it was like taking half of our own power all over. We could do things we never could before. But little bro was a little furious and in pain. His tone went quiet. Strange how you feel something for a mistake you made. But I did. And we ran instead of turning and trying to rip him apart. We didn't know how to use the power. We had it for only seconds. But sister, she's smart, a good girl. She got an idea roughly and took off above with some help. She flew and I helped her lift off, brother explained. And he smiled at the memory. Delta remembered Sister's words back when she saw the edge of the world. You fell on your face, Delta said in understanding. The brother's face went blank. I tripped, he said childishly. Delta blinked. On what? There wasn't anything back then, right? She pondered. Brother's yellow eyes met hers. I panicked. I didn't know how to use my rather disgusting eyeballs yet. And so I flew, directly down, and I sank like a rock. Then I just wanted to be safe. So I made the world, he huffed. That is the ditziest origin story that I have ever heard. Delta snorted. She was smacked in the arm by the child. Please, I heard about the things you did in the brief message my sister sent. Something about screaming and mushrooms, he grinned back. His horrid face didn't quite get any easier to look at, but Delta was relieved to see the humor in his eyes. Damn, he had ammunition. Well, as this became the sun and I the ground, on which you all live on, you're welcome, by the way. That little brother of ours was blind and bleeding. He was pure black and water flowed from his eyes and covered the land. My back, mind you, not the greatest feeling in the world, I'll let you know. Brother shuddered and chewed some more alderish fish thing. The water gathered and over time things began to grow out of it like fungus or moss, and then one day when I bothered to ask sister to check, there were these tiny little things, like what little bro looked like, but one million the size. People, sis thought they looked cute, and I was worried that they would get in my butt, he grimaced. Little bro, according to sis, cause I was face down like a Friday night, vanished into the pool of darkness. I saw him fall down below, he was kind of empty, like a debated balloon. Brother hummed and Delta slowly turned her eyes to the rod that she held. The fishing rod in the abyss. Yeah, no luck. I've been trying to find him to see if he's past his biting stage, but I think he might be a bit annoyed at me, the boy guessed. Delta's head was spinning. Your little brother made all life on the world, but that can't be. Delta cut off as she remembered something. The memory of the farmer, the way his body had broken down into a moat, deepy and uh, that black spore. Yep. Every person ever born on this plane has a bit of little bro inside. Tiny sparks of creation, Delta's companion said, Delta frowned. So what gives them manner of either their own abilities, or side effects of being basically cells of a deformed god? She screeched, and brother shrugged. Gods isn't right, we're more like cosmic entities. We were just born from a higher nature. 
No, wait, that still sounds massively dickish. Um, we were born in a weirder conceptual part of reality, he beamed. Wait, so he made monsters and the other species? Delta asked, so utterly unable to stop asking questions. Brother shook his head. The other species were indeed of the same source, but monsters, those were mine, he admitted. Delta nearly dropped the rod. You made monsters. She began to wave her arms like a chicken. The boy looked annoyed. Sister opened up the stairs and let tons of faith be possible. I made monsters, natural spore seekers, that she made reality portals to basically let all people sell their spores for power. I think my action was less drastic, he complained. Why? Delta needed to know for sanity's sake. Well, spores eaten by monsters come to me and become my power. Spores converted by faith give us a percent of the power. People are rad, hurrah! But years of continuous power, training, and the use of their own manner can cause their spores to grow over the years. If really strong people were to be left to their own thing, little bro would have eventually had the bare bones to step back in and just eat his own little children. We let people sell their souls to a god for a paradise and my monsters take care of the heroes. The stronger the spore grows in the people, the stronger the monsters I create to take them down. I kill them to keep the rest away from hungry, hungry hippo little brother. And sis tries to ferry the best into a better state than food. Brother stood and began to pace. Delta stared, not sure if horror or fear was taking the lead in her chest. Obviously, it wasn't a good system, so we knocked our heads together and combined our methods. Monsters to hunt the heroes and a field of awareness to spread manner out of the slowly convert people into beings free of the spore. Dungeons are what happens when you mix the purifying power of the system and killing powers of monsters. Brother turned to Delta face blank. Delta let that thought carry itself. People settled around dungeons, the strong went inside and fought, usually dying, but the dungeon manor leaked out and became stronger over the years. People acted more alive with dungeon manor. Manor was trying to eat the spores inside of them. If people never went inside a dungeon, then they were still getting passively cured of its spore. The ones with the huge power over themselves, a strong spore, they would seek to use the power and hence the dungeon still served the purpose to lure them in. But over time, or with their death, the spore would be reclaimed. Delta felt used. Not that you're designed at the same or the same purpose, Brother added, and Delta's inner side down a dark series of thoughts were interrupted. What? She asked dumbly. He was picking his nose again, looking around as if he'd found something worth digging out. We got tons of dungeons working together. You're kind of a step in a new version of things, really. You don't have a real goal outside of seeing what would happen once we plugged you in. So, uh, well done for doing your best. The child grinned as he flicked the glowing snot into the abyss tunnel, where it exploded like some small nova. I don't consume spores, Data responded in a confused tone. No, you still have all the bells and whistles, but you're kind of a, uh, what you call it? An experiment based on information that sister has been gathering. We've been wanting a dungeon near that kooky town for a while and over the top of that anthill filled with nut jobs. The idiot's trying to coax little brother back into the physical world by gathering the ripest spores in one place. Now they blew themselves up a nice fish hole like me. And that town's waking up. The spores were dying, but the little orange mist leaked life into them, and their own manner is more than enough to sustain the spore for years before you claim it. He shrugged as if it was a minor detail. Delta could see that Durant's folk were nothing if not a little lively, but that aside, it raised a whole new issue. You expected me to be able to hurt someone in Durance? Delta asked, voice so incredulous that it nearly snorted. Well, not at first. I told you that the stronger the hero or tyrant, the stronger the monster that can appear. Your human mind was a huge success, so I kind of thought that you would eventually snag in a few of their own rules would keep you somewhat safe. But your human heart was an interesting side effect. I should have guessed, since we put a person in a core, that they would be a bit unpredictable, he mused, not sounding upset at all. The rod in Delta's hand tugged once before going limp. She eyed it, but didn't move. So, if I can, kill people that make dragons pee themselves, and then passively kill their spores. But that was a side job. What was the original plan? 
I know that you said there was none, but I am not just Delta. I am the Delta in the plan of yours, and there is a Beta, so there has to be an Alpha at least, but that tells me that you used me as the fourth for something. Because other than failed, or perhaps because you were trying different things, she questioned. Her voice was quiet and the question scared her more than she cared to admit. The amused look on brother's yellow eyes dimmed a bit, and the demon child once again was an alien being, staring at her with a little hint of emotion that Delta could empathize with. Here was a being that was trying very hard to be human, for her, but at that moment it all dropped pretense and Delta saw that it had it meant by cosmic. His form rippled and they looked into the tiny sea of stars with blaring yellow eyes. Sound dimmed and they sucked away, and the eye behind them looked tiny next to this being. Then it was gone and Brother smiled, impressed. Delta felt like the question had been a surprise, and his reaction was more a knee-jerk reaction than any attempt to scare her. Yeah, you could say that. Don't worry, Sunshine, you're unique and definitely the least boring of the lot. Well, Gamma is funny, and I watched him do things that you wouldn't believe, just because he's Gamma. He's got swallowed by a king walk and spent a week cutting its heart loose inside to get freed. The idiot forgot that sword sank. Brother slapped his knee. Nalta was leaning in, eager. Gamma. There was a Gamma. He could cut things. Was he a warrior? Being swallowed meant he was mobile, combined with Drizzle's comments on Beta. I'm the only one who got turned into a dungeon. Actually, what's the walk? Delta added quickly. That was the bug her if she didn't know. It's like a shark but whale size and has three teeth that just jut out of horns and it also conscious storms. Kinda nice with hot sauce. Brother explained calmly. Ah. But, yeah, you're a dungeon. See, D is for dungeon. Brother whispered as if it was a secret. Delta blinked once. Excuse me? She replied flatly and assumed her face was blank. You're excused, but G is for gatherer and B is for beast and A is for adventure. Brother sang, Please tell me that you got based all of this on plucking our souls or something on more than just a bad tune. Data pleaded and brother snorted, A lot more, but that makes me look like I have wisdom and foresight and even some maturity. I am none of those things. All right, you got a little time, and I guess you've proven to actually tap deeper into your gift than any other. Gamma is close, and I can't wait to meet him, but you. You won over my sister and yelled at a snob tree. That's pretty good. You're also doing work on freeing the richest and darkest spores in that cave. That's good. So there's some little tit for tat in this plan, brother offered. Alpha was designed to travel and blend in with people to convert them like a dungeon but the spores would increase in their own power. Since he was our first, well, I'd like to say that he's a jewel of the pick, but Alpha is a little too deep into the power thing. He was supposed to lead a powerful to him, all being heroic, but he's actually a brat who hides behind the system. Brother held up his finger in count. Beta is the other end of the spectrum. She was gifted to not be bothered with the spore collecting beyond basic monster abilities. That left a lot of room to give her the ability to use anything that I had at hand in making him to empower herself. She's our draw to the retired folks that lost fighters. A monster that has no weaknesses, it'd draw the spores in mass to her. She's kind of doing her job, but she really didn't like us and wasn't thankful about her hand in her fate. We wanted a beast, and now that beast is snapping at our fingers. Serves me right for trying to be clever. He held up his second finger. Gamma was the best result, in my opinion. No offense. He winked at her and Delta shrugged one shoulder, showing that she had none taken. She didn't want to ask questions, not yet. Delta was desperate to learn of her brothers and sisters, of sorts. Gamma took his job well and decided that if Alpha could get his head out of his butt, he would need a weapon to handle his growing strength. I decided to add Gamma to the weapons and the precaution. Do you know how annoying it would be if some cult or some jerk got the sword and heroes had spent 40 hours of blabbering and dramatic speeches to get the sword back? I'm rude, lazy, and the guy was wrecked up badly a few times. At least I could do is make sure that the outcome didn't happen. Gamma, he seemed to enjoy the idea. He became that weapon. He got a lot of comedy material luring wannabe dark lords and mad swordsmen to him so that he could literally stab them in the back. 
Gamma grinned. He stretched out the darkness, moving away from him, as if afraid. Anyone he cut got their spore taken, and he would grow in power. Everyone likes growth weapons. He nodded, and he looked at Tarza for agreement. I like things that grow and don't stab people, but sure. She smiled weakly. Brother looked skyward where a beam of yellow light was growing from the pinpricks to a lantern. Sister won't be long. She's been patching up defenses in the dungeons from the mighty weed. He explained. He pointed to Delta, who blinked. Delta was to be the base. Delta would settle near the strongest people around, and on top of an oozing wound to seal it and begin to claim very powerful spores. They would meet the Silence Army and seek to rob them of their power wherever and however they could. They would forge the path to the deepest layer and become the layer to test Alpha, to make sure that he was ready to do what he could, to be strong enough to contract Beta if she were to convince her group to join up, to feed Gamma the rarest and most powerful materials to fuel his growth. Brother began to smile. Delta barely felt the rod tugging in her hands, too shocked at what she was hearing to notice. Dalta was the most important part and she utterly failed in most tasks. She is a peace-loving girl who raises friends and makes very weird monsters. I've never been proud of something that I had direct hand in. So listen to me here. Me and Sis, we're just people with big stupid plans and bigger hopes. Be yourself and I think that'll be enough. He reached over and helped her pull out the rod. They both watched as the silvery wire reeled up, and the object dangling at the end made them both stare. A simple orange mushroom. It swung a few times and then Brother was laughing, a huge gut-hurtling gale of laughter. Then Delta was swallowed by Sister's light above. Hello? Delta blinked and nearly fell backwards from the green menu that was being consumed by an orange hue. What? Brother? Fishing mushroom? She blabbered. She pointed to the menu and New turned his own screen. Delta, you okay? You were spacing out for a minute. Delta showed him a shocked look. I was gone. I saw a huge tree and I saw a brother, sister's brother, and then I was in the center of the world. And I fished up a mushroom and brother told me the secrets of life and my existence. She continued. Braining her hands, New was quiet before he looked back at the now orange menu. Delta stared at it in surprise as the message was there. System has been patched. Your antivirus has been updated. Trojan trees added to blacklist and attempts to be breached by the source of the virus have been met with uh, extreme results. I have an antivirus, she asked, a voice in an odd tone of disbelief. News menu seemed to deflate. Of course you do, but I guess whatever happened to you happened in, well, speeds faster than reality, much like traveling the line lines and the power of the systems. What happened? Delta explained the sheer amount of bizarre things that she had learned from herself, and of the others, Alpha, Beta, and Gamma. They all sound terrible. I'm glad I got stuck with you. You're a pain that I've learned to deal with. Thank you, I think? She tilted her head. I don't know how I should feel. Everything I'm doing is some plan, despite me somehow messing that plan up. She began a new screen flashed. I'm shocked. Really, I am. Delta ignored New and his sarcasm. It still feels like everything I'm doing may be preordained. It's creepy. She complained. New turned to the large beast hall, the trolls and goyles watching them in little subtlety. If they predicted this, then they are all-knowing, and I want to hit them both for it. But I highly suspect that they are as in the dark about this and how you work as you are yourself. Nothing you do is predictable. You made this dungeon. You made these monsters. You made me. Well, you broke me. Same difference. Delta tried not to roll her eyes too hard at his comments. I've seen Sis at work. Trust me, perfect and working have very different meanings to her. So what if you were programmed to end up as the most deadly dungeon ever, yet somehow ended up selling beer and pots? Usually, life happens differently than how people plan it to. So stop sulking and take a break from all of this. Delta gave him her full attention. Knew we got a horde of nasties and a cold jerks through the door, gaining power. They can come through at any time. How could I relax with this around? She reminded, and there was a soft chime as this stack of notifications awaited Delta's attentions. I shall allow the system to answer that question. New faded and was replaced by a series of windows. World tree sample absorbed. Increased defense from the power of the world tree. 
World Tree would be available to purchase but effectively impossible due to astronomical costs. System has converted this option into a powerful upgrade for Wyam and Maestro. Upgrade cost 200 DP. Wyam will have gained immunity to low class magic and produce powerful fruit that causes the eater to be brutally honest with themselves. Wyam's nature has shaped this outcome. The fruit is called Wyam's Trees. Vera can use this magically powerful fruit to make fruit cocktails with a marginally weaker effect that causes a slip of the tongue. Maestro's root tunnels will become improved and allow his form to appear on any floor as long as the proper stage has been set up to host him. All the bargain songs and tunes of power, hymns of healing and cursed classics will be stronger when Maestro sings on the same floor as the music. Having his stage in a certain rooms or areas will give Maestro a job inside that area. All jobs are related to music in some fashion. Movement from one location to another takes around 10 minutes on each end. That's awesome! Delta's face split wide as a smile, and her urge to hit the confirm button and let two of her greener monsters get sweet upgrades was strong, but she held back until she saw the rest of the windows. Ruins on the head researcher's door had been scanned and added to the system. Most ruins were dissolved upon unlocking the door, but two key ruins have been successfully learned. Gain the Ruin of Rocking, a simplistic rune that is laid upon a door or chest to keep it sealed against moderate physical or magical effort. This rune cannot be used to seal doors leading to the core unless an appropriate key is made and available to intruders. However, areas not leading to the core are allowed to be sealed without a key. Each rune costs 50 mana to place. Gain the Ruin of Heat, the rune that inflicts moderate thermal damage to anyone who attempts to touch whatever object or area that the surface is covered by the ruin. Each ruin costs 50 mana to place. Oh, now she had magical symbols of power. Dalta tried not to think about what would happen if she just messed with them. She was beginning to remember that Dalta itself was a powerful symbol in things. Ruin of heat plus Dalta equals horrid but maybe funny outcomes. But she knew what New would be hinting towards. The locking rune would be pretty handy on keeping the reminder of the silence army behind the door so that Delta could just have a day off to herself. Just her, her dungeon, and fun, but maybe meaningless tinkering. Delta hadn't had a moment to herself since the Spider Queen. Well, this is what it was going to be like when all of her floors were constantly full. Bored watching people over the years while she eagerly waited for the moments in which she could just get some peace and quiet and do her own thing. The reality sounded like a cranky old maid, but Delta was worried they would come true. She considered that for a moment and then shrugged. If she needed space, she'd simply ask. People usually polite enough in her experience. There was always the possibility of getting Rudy to give her a hand to give any stragglers the heave-ho but the more flaws that she had, the less that would have a likely issue. For now, she floated down to her garden and focused on the large twin doors which Jack had described as having another hole in front of them to deal with and then the throne room beyond it. Plenty of space and holes in which to build a nasty little army. She focused on the two doors and smiled. Her call was back fairly far behind her and she didn't need any keys of the sort. She felt 100 mana drain as two flashing orange lights began to burn themselves into the two doors, one on each room. It felt stronger than a single larger symbol over both. The two symbols blazed, shaped like two orange delta symbols. She stared. I would have thought the ruin of rocking had its own symbol, she said lamely, trying to make a vague design with her hands. The symbols have begun to new register and compiled runes. Runes were a way of controlling either ambient human manner or a wild calling upon the deity. Ergo, runes can be whatever shape we desire, since the power of the siblings is your source now. The delta symbol means protection. The system finds that fitting, after all, and locking it just means it's security. Thank you, I think. So, what each rune I learn gets a new symbol for a unique use. Or, if I teach others, do we invent a new magic ruin system? She exclaimed in shock. Yes, the system congratulates the core, Delta, on breaking apart the magical creation of primordial means to impart magic on the physical world by etches and intent. The system is proud of you. Delta beamed until her face fell. You're just messing with me, aren't you? She asked, crestfallen. 
the screen, turned to a hue of blue, and Nu shook off his disguise, his normal screen taking the place of the system window. Of course, but I'd do it with a genuine fondness. The new ruined language was legit, and Sis did honestly make you the symbol of protection. It's sickeningly sweet. I asked to be the symbol of wit or intelligence, but Sis said she already knows what symbol I am, and I have to let you know that an adept mage in the dungeon can create ruins eventually. However, I doubt we'll ever see any results for a while. Swan was bashing his staff hard into the ground. He growled at the mushrooms trying to invade the bar again. Farah wouldn't serve him till he got rid of the blighters on the doorstep. His staff smacked into the muddy round of the mushrooms, and he seemed to almost wiggle side to side to avoid the blows. He wished that he could just use fire, but the gut rods tended to explode if exposed to high heat. Fire shouldn't be so limited, but Swan sorely wished that he could just set them all on fire. The rough mess on the ground left behind while his staff on the ground began to pulse with an orange light. Swan paused, not sure what this malarkey was all about. The symbol looked like a curved crescent moon and a really fancy sea, with little horns on top. Was it just him or was the air getting hot? There was a mighty boom as the mushrooms erupted in a flash of fire, and Swan was sent flying back, arcing over the bar. He looked up from where he landed at an unimpressed Farah. Good news, mushrooms gone. Bad news is that drawing naughty pictures in the dirt is going to have to be put on hold for a small while, he explained, coughing out the plumes of black smoke. You got more than two to worry about. You just smashed into me glasses of beer, and you want to grab a broom, or will I kick you around until you sweep up the mess? She asked lightly. Swan glared, but then went to fetch the broom. The symbol that he had burned etched into his own mind. Fire from a funny shape. That had potential. Special Ruin of Fire, Goblin, has been created, a wicked ruin that requires little mana to activate. In return, the Maker has a little control over it. It may detonate in a few seconds or hours, with smoke or fire hot enough to melt steel. A magical ruin created by the Pyromancer, Swa. Fire solves everything. Army, use fire. Demons, fire. Fire, use bigger fire. I often forget that you are not a normal dungeon. Data could only smile. Want to go take the day off and have fun and mess with things? I think we need a break, she offered. New seemed to sigh. I suspect that even goofing off something will go horribly wrong. But I suppose I have nothing better to do. That's the spirit. When in down, you just go with the flow, Delta instructed and turned, leaving the glowing Delta symbols ablaze, the very meaning keeping the first wave of danger firmly locked away. For now. End of chapter. There is no epic loot champ, only puns. Chapter 101. How to be a dungeon. What are you doing? New asked as Delta made a window and began to write with a finger as a pen. Rough squiggles and chicken scratch transformed into an elegant Victorian cool type calligraphy with large flourishes and loops so grand that they could drive a car through them. Delta snorted. I would love to write like that, but let's be honest, she tidied the window. The text blurred again and changed into a simple black text. Delta smiled and turned to New. Well, the whole thing with Bro happened so fast that it'll just be a ton of questions are coming to me. Like, you can hardly blame me. I was kidnapped by a tree and rescued by the world's oldest annoying sibling, she complained. She pointed at the first line. Like, for example, did I choose my name or was that some compulsion? Since Alpha, Beta, and Gamma were around, that means all four of us went with Greek lettering, were our numbering. That's unlikely to be a random thing, she stated. I can ask if you want. Sis is mostly doing patchwork and working on her inter-dungeon communication project. Delta hesitated but decided the nagging feeling of never knowing would be worse than just knowing, no matter what the answer was. She could learn to deal with it if she knew. Delta would never be able to heal her mental trauma if she refused to learn. Please. New was gone before she finished speaking. Delta, however, hovered over the core on its platform and eyed the glowing four inside. She was latched onto the name for the longest time due to that symbol. It felt like so long ago, like the beginning of a book that had too many chapters. She distracted herself by adding more questions to the important questions to ask next time kidnapped list. New reappeared. I have returned. 
he declared with almost no sarcasm. Dalton made a little wave of her hands to celebrate. Sis said that you were simply named 1, 2, 3, and 4. However, when making the vessels for each of your spings, some of which took longer than others, Sis and her brother took to considering what you all knew, summing up what language and what ideas all you knew and the combining them to prevent having to make four different language modules. Extra was stored for when you were all ready to absorb them. Most of you knew the common language and many ideas, one of which was the words Alpha to your own name, Delta. So, it wasn't a compulsion as much as you all having the other languages and ideas delayed at the beginning. You all reached from the same pool of knowledge. So, not mind controlled, just being uncreative and thinking we're cool, Delta summed up, and you shrugged. Uncreative, sure, let's go with that. Sir so still let slip that one called Alpha named himself due to the state of the system. He was the first around and had the Alpha state, as she called it. Interesting, but if you weren't called Delta, what would you call yourself now? New asked, interested. The question surprised her, but the answer was quick to come. Darth Fluffy, the destroyer of mankind, a deliverer of muffins. She said easily. New merely turned to her list. What other questions did you have? Delta stuck her tongue out at him, but read off the next one. If bro made monsters, then what are domains and why do monsters go for dungeons if they're supposed to be working together? She mused, like the Spider Queen. I doubt Sis can answer that. I do not have a direct link to Brother, sadly. But we can speculate. Brother may have made them to search for these spores of the lost sibling. They are created with instincts and desire to feed your sources of spores, even if they are previous experiments. And one dungeons are a step up from doesn't mean that they know about it. Monsters are created by manner, but they are also breed and mutate. The brother designed them to survive regardless of what people did, no doubt. Perhaps feeding over the dungeons is something that they themselves don't understand. Maybe, in some way, they sense themselves in dungeons. Perhaps they sense the spores that the dungeons have or echoes of them. Hard to tell. Damn, New was good at this. But I have only killed one person, so I don't have a lot of spores around, she reminded. Yes, but you are removing them from the pupil endurance. You are taking their purpose one way or another. Also, I hate to remind you, but we are sitting on the pit of insane people who worship the lost sibling. Their spores may be very ripe, alluring. Perhaps that is why they were even attacked. Delta frowned. Kind of wish that you would ask the Spider Queen, but I kind of... Oh, Delta blinked and then specked her head. I absorbed her remains and her kids. I should be able to sift through the memories or something. She said and knew was quiet. Could be risky. So is being here and being bored. Slap me if I start charting backwards and grow extra legs, she beamed. Do you even know how to lock onto the previously absorbed remains, or are you just going to wing it? Delta answered him and closed her eyes. Right. She was Delta. She was the air she floated in. She was the ground around the her. She was the very light that touched the rocks. She was the world around her, and she was no longer just Delta, a human-shaped girl. She was everything. To go from seeing with two eyes to being a dungeon aware of every bit of movement and sound was always going to be weird. But the cool detachment allowed her to focus on her goal. New also vanished and seemed to be a part of her spirit. A sliver of purpose and distrust, not towards her, but towards all that was in Delta. He went with her like a sparrow perched on her shoulder. His presence bore comfort, despite Delta knowing that she didn't need it in this mindset. Delta began to move through her logs, her human nature making it sorted by time instead of importance or usefulness. It made flipping back easy. She felt more tortures of warmth as she refreshed herself on the previous day's events. Biting slimes, explosions, Jack. So much had happened, but she flipped back and found the moment that she had uh, slightly exploded the queen. Her form, her soul at least, had been devoured by the dungeon and refunneled into the queenie who was in Ferris bar, drinking shroom pop, breaking him down into an option, but Delta discarded that thought with ease. No, she would have to do what the pale limitation. Queenie was worth ten spider queens to Delta. She focused on the exact moment the spider queen had been devoured, her dark, ugly being that was burning. Delta weaved her manner together and did her best to restore what her dungeon had eaten. 
It was like building a 3D jigsaw puzzle, with half of the pieces cut in half and no picture to guide her. A shriek of arrogance and awareness came from the puzzle and Data nearly snapped that particular piece of black in half. She wasn't interested in the squaring off with the dead queen unless she had no option. No. Data was focused on the part that was shaping up like a web, her memory cortex of the queen. It was an intricate thing and Data saw it as a messy and incomplete. Even her best attempts to rebuild it, the damage had been great. Still, the silver, like bees on the web, powerful memories did cling to it. Data was quick to move through them, most with the queen's eventual evolution paths, from tiny worker to beautiful queen, in her eyes. Strong stuff, but Data had to work fast before she became a little too detached. A few memories show the battle of various people, one of them being Ruli, a very young Ruli. She was adorable, and she had exploded the spiders and cut more in twain. A recent memory revealed a distorted image of the queen and her army being pressed into submission by a figure with a horrible grin. He was sucking something in from the queen with a jaw. Delta watches the queen reward, holding out its last bit of darkness. The man walked away with ease. From the fraying of memory, the queen despaired as the loss of darkness, but what was left led her downwards. The queen was severely weakened from the man sapping the dark cloud, a cloud of spores from her. Delta had faced off with the weakened queen. Delta returned to herself, back to her human mind and shape. She blinked slowly. That was confusing, she blinked. The spider queen was not a purifying of the spores. She was hoarding them. That the spores had affected her, it's disturbing. We know so little about spores and that is dangerous. Delta frowned and crossed her arms. Can't we ask us to hold on to one of us, or something? She suggested, and he was quiet for a while. His screen slowly filled with text. I don't think so. I think that is the reason that the menu system shuts down when people come into the dungeon. Why I disappear and you can't bring up any windows. Sist must be making sure that those parts won't be around people where spores might gain access. Valid idea, but Delta was thinking quick. But what about the challenge windows? They appear before people and even talk through them, she reminded. They are conjured by people approaching the room. Their own manner activates the window. Let's be honest, I'm not supposed to be doing these things. But there is one way that we could properly examine the spores and maybe see what makes them tick. Delta raised one brow and waited for the idea to merge from New's tricky brain. You interfaced with Dio, you searched his frame and did one-on-one -on -one connection. I hadn't considered it important or impressive, but you interacted with an outside being on your own. And I have a bunch of them coming to do a mock fight with the dungeon. I could just invade their personal and physical space and feel for a spore. I'm sure that'll go down well, she replied dryly. An idea for another time. Any other questions you plan to ask? Delta thought about it. Nothing earth-shaking, but I kind of wanted to know if I was allowed to not work with Alpha and the others if they turn out to be bad people. I'll do my best to put my own issues aside if it saves a ton of lives, but I hope that I have some right for myself to not have to work with them if it comes down to it. She blew out a sigh. Newswinder shook slightly as if chuckling. I have a feeling most of them would struggle to be more than a pain. I think between your monsters and the monsters who pretend to be human endurance, you really don't need three saps who haven't even broken the system according to brother. Come on, you did that on your first day or something, please, such amateurs. Delta hid a smile from news complaining on her behalf. She floated in the stairs and hummed, maybe... But if they turn out to be okay, I could give them some tips, she giggled. She was sure that she was beginning to grasp the dungeon thing. After all, she had made it to the floor three in her first month. She had tons of rare monsters and a circus. Did Beta have a circus? Delta doubted it. She snorted at her own cockiness, but decided her little holiday was meant to be fun, so she floated back to Wyme's room and thought of how she was going to be pretty damn good for a sappy human. A memory hit her and Delta paused. She looked down at the ground with a frown. Delta just remembered that she hadn't apologized for vomiting on Bro's tunnels. She hoped that he didn't hold it against her. Brother was poking at the orange patch with a stick. 
He hadn't known what to do with the remnants of Dalta's essence, but it seemed to have its own ideas as it slowly crawled along the inner paths of his body as if searching for something. Feeling interesting, amusement and fondness at the same time, Brother teleported the sand about 34 miles in the direction that it was heading. Nothing was important between there and where it had been. The stain seemed to pause and then carry on its way an old series of pillars and pulsing images. Then each pillar was a set of very old, incredibly potent words of power. The verbal equivalent of ruins. These simple words would enable an individual to bend existence. Brother had tons of these ruins where the words of power hummed and pulsed all across the world. Each one had a particular purpose like gravity, or soil richness, or poison ivy. The last one deserved its own spot because people who actually enjoyed sleeping in the wild should be punished. This particular set was very large, one of Brother's biggest. It controlled the monster species balanced at creation. The orange splatter seeped into one of the pillars and began to turn the picture from a dull brown to a brightly glowing orange thing. Brother stared, his smile growing even wider. This was going to be fun. Sure, the stain had only had enough to convert one style of monster and only a tiny fraction of it. But still, Brother was loving it. On a grassy plain, far above and under the gentle rays of the sun, a batch of slimes bubbled into existence out of the pure manner to start doing what slimes did best, eat. Except the smallest one in the new batches was still. It looked to the sun and a small round body and a black button eyes blinked a few times. Pew, it yawned, as its bright orange body glittered like a jewel. The little slime didn't feel hunger as strongly as it felt something else. Curiosity. I'm sure it's no big deal, Delta explained to Wyam. Of course, my sweet creator, no big deal, but this boy, this brother, seems like a cur and you need not worry about him. But I am vastly interested in this upgrade you mentioned. I do love being slightly immune to things. She smiled wickedly, and Delta shot her a look which made Wyam shrug. I'm a tree. I like to not be set on fire, she said with no shame. A fair point, Dalta had to imagine. How would you put it? I'm not... Inflammable? Wyam tried, and the sheer pain at the attempt at a joke was clear in her voice. Dalta stared. Inflam... Oh, oh! Dalta's smile went wide, and she felt laughter rising up in her chest like a fuzzy burp. That's a good one, she said a new look between them in disgust. I don't even get it, and I hate it. Wyam nodded. It's a play on the word infallible, where she began and Dalta waved her hands with a slight cry. No, he can't explain it if it's not funny anymore, she protested. Wyam frowned and Dalta did some quick thinking. Imagine the sheer torture but not sharing the joke. She encouraged and Wyam poked up like Dalta had given her a gift. Oh yes, I can imagine that very well. I shall practice more cutting remarks than add salt to the wounds. Puns. I shall suffer them to my foes and will die from them. She cackled and her branches erupted into thorns. She saw Dalta's flat expression and she cleared her throat, meaning how they will groan in traumatic pain for years to come. Alive, unmaimed, she said weakly. Dalta guessed that that was the best that she was going to get for a while. Maybe after a few real fights, Wyam would call off and take up knitting sheaths for swords or quivers for arrows or something. Dalta could only hope. Let me talk to Maestro first and since this affects the both of you, she asked. A few mushrooms scattered about the room twitched. I was listening to this lovely gaggle of girls, and I, the amazing fabulous Maestro, agree to the upgrade. A chance for more of my fans to see my glorious self in person. Honey, put the pen away, I already signed the yes box with a kiss. Excellent, the mushrooms and the tree are all in agreement. We want to be upgraded. Wyam gestured, and one lowly willowy bronze as if encouraging Delta to hurry. Rolling her eyes to the needy house fonts, she brought up the menu and purchased a hefty 200 dp upgrade for them. The dungeon was quiet for a moment, when Wyam's bark began to crack and a deep light flowed from them. The mushrooms were pulsing and shaking as Maestro's sing-song voice became a tremble with surprise. By the sweet mercy of Mama, this feels intense he said, his voice shaking as if vibrating. Wyam exploded like a caterpillar escaping from a cocoon, using a heavy dose of C4 and dynamite. 
wood chips were sent flying in the storms of leaves that made Wyam into the eye of the storm. Before her brownish bark looked a shade lighter, but now it had tiny pulsing green veins that were turning orange. Her face, which had only been shaped somewhat like a woman, was now perfectly detailed, as if it were sculpted by an artist. Her lips pulsed as ivy and the thin moss made waves of hair that cascaded down to the tree's navel, which even had a new belly button. She stretched, feeling out her new form. Delta covered her eyes. Wyam, you're really detailed all the way down, she yelled, face going red. Wyam's legs still merged and fused with the roots of the trees, but her body, which looked smooth yet natural, with leaves and mushroom caps as decorative accessories, as her arms split into dozens of branches. Mmm, yes, I see that I have a rather subtle size now. Wyam said pleased. That was not what was concerning Delta. She peeked and saw Wyam shaking her head and flower buds grew and the vines exploded into a bloom of a vivid red with white blossoms, as if the flowers had been stained with red. I'm just teasing, see? Wyam's soft purr of a voice tempted Delta to look once more as she sighed with relief, as the tree had now had a thin veil of leaves that acted like a thin cloak or a towel. Her shoulders were bare, and her attempt at decency didn't seem to be a very good one. And when Wyam moved, the leaves parted to tease to show what was any given time. Still, Delta respected her monster's choices in the long run. If wanted to be natural in her own time, it was only fair to respect that. But if she was going to be fighting young men and women, and then see this respect them too. Do you want to taste my sweet fruit? It's bursting with juice and one nibble can make it leak. Wyam offered, leaning down. Delta gaped, and the tree blinked confused before her words seemed to catch up to her. Instead of shame or embarrassment, Wyam seemed amused, her arms slowing to show her orange peach-like fruit. Delta right them. Why are they peaches? She began, and Wyam cut her off. Because they look like butts, and I like making you flustered. She grinned. Delta pointed a finger at her in a scandalized look. I saved you from Seth and his wandering words. To think that you were just as bad, she accused. Why I merely hid her smile behind a branch. I am naught but a child of Delta. I am innocent but delicious. Bite me gently, sir or madam. She cooed and Delta covered her ears. La 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 la. I can't hear this, she yelled. Wyam's clear, bell-like tingling laugh sounded out. It wasn't a cackle or even a mean sound. It was just something rare. General amusement and affection. You are too sweet for this world. How I worry for you, Wyam smiled. I didn't sign up for the seductive murder tree, Delta grumbled. Wyam leaned down and wrapped her branches around the space where Delta stood. You can't often choose the people we consider family, but we simply have to do our best, hmm? Now I suggest you go and check on the drama king. He is being far too quiet for my liking, Wyam suggested. Delta had to agree, but she narrowed her eyes at Wyam. We could have kids coming into the dungeon, and one kind of sweet girl. You are to be on your best behavior, she commanded. Wyam blinked three times. Oh, lovely creator, Wyam, tree is about love, didn't you know? She giggled and stretched her full length. Delta was beginning to think that this was an upgrade had given Wyam something to make her feel good. Either that or Wyam was getting her torture johnnies from somewhere Delta had no idea about. Higgy, as Beta often called him, was feeling ragged. Not only had his very soul been singed so bad that it hurt, to be hurt, to think, as his attempts to track down Delta's back to her source had been met with, uh, something he couldn't quite remember but he had a fleeting images of round spheres of screens of a girl and her furious expression. Then the past that he had made for invading areas had simply ceased to be. Gone and lost. His memory somehow also cut loose as if the girl wanted no stone unturned in her attack. Iggy was furious as he retreated to lick his wounds, as it were. But what was worse than the damn feeling of uh, others? He was the world tree. There was power in that title for Iggy to play with, but he sensed two others now. Two new potential world beings, so tiny, so pathetic, but still growing. And one of them was a semi-aware of him. It radiated mockery and cruelty at his fury. It seemed to grow and sigh at his own rage built. 
he was the world tree and the stick had taken his power. In the mockery came the name that made Iggy feel both cold and curious. Wyan. That was not possible, but there was another that just seemed content to sing and demand as if most tunes weren't stuck in Iggy's head. He sulked, peeled, and blotted. Delta eyed Wyam in a good mood only seemed to get brighter. Odd tree, very odd. Delta decided to get to the root of her other issues and left Wyam to start her own branch of bad jokes. All this excitement was getting to Wyam eventually, and she was going to need to lay down soon for rest. Delta had to stop in the middle of a jungle as a fit of giggles tried to escape her. Yes, I can see it now, you truly were meant to be the deadliest dungeon that ever existed. Yu's words were as sweet as ever, and Delta couldn't help but flutter her eyelashes at him. I knew you would understand. She grinned. Yu's glare was powerful despite having no eyes. Delta took off flying, her laughter making the jungle come to life with echoes of joy and noise. She couldn't wait to see Maestro. End of chapter there is no epic lucha, only puns. Chapter 102 The Dance of the Dead and Fabulous. Maestro's room was cast in shadows. The usual glow of moss and twiggling starlight mushrooms had been dimmed, and the effort had been made the cavernous room was set to rest, a place the world had forgotten or chose to leave in peace. Drips of falling water sounded like musical notes as a peaceful calm of the room swam over Delta. She floated gently up to the stone stairs, past the slumbering gutrots, starlights, tasty mushrooms, and others. She wanted to call out, but the serene, peaceful aura had stolen her voice. Delta didn't want to ruin the wonderful feeling with something like mere words. She reached the summit, and the shadow maestro's huge form was also still. It lay wrapped up in many roots on the ceiling, so still. That was odd. Delta had never seen Maestro still, let alone quiet. He didn't seem to be in pain or at odds with the roots. In fact, he looked like in deep comfort and safe. Delta let herself space out and saw his roots. Maestro's very thin mind expanding into the odd spaces between the floors where things didn't quite make sense. His roots buried deep and began to find spots in the floors below. Potential stages, like the menu had informed her. He shan't be long, came the good-natured voice of Lord Mushy. Delta saw him resting in the shadow corner. She had unconsciously felt him there and didn't flinch when he spoke. Looking out for him, she teased and Lord Mushy hummed. I do worry about his flamboyant sibling. One tends to worry when family goes on a rock and roll. I dread the after-parties to come. He mocked and sighed. No groupies until he's at least two years old, Delta said calmly but firmly. Lord Mushy gave his hearty chuckle once more. I shall make sure he is informed, but I dare say that we are unlikely to stop that, as we can stop Swa playing with fire, or Bori eating mushrooms, or Bacon giving them back in a gaseous form. He said brightly. The mushrooms around them started to stir, and Delta looked up, excited to see Maestro and his new potential upgrades. Maestro's form cracked like an egg, and Delta blinked straight up with a wide alarm, and then it split open, and green fluid rained down like a waterfall, and Delta gave a shriek as it passed over her and into the floor. The room promptly got rid of it, since it wasn't supposed to be, but there was a scent of lingering cooked mushrooms, and her hair felt oily. From the shell that was Maestro came a glowing green mist that sparkled in the light of the starlight mushrooms. The mist showed a smaller shadow emerging. It was about two feet shorter and maybe a little thinner, connected still by dozens of roots. Its figure lowered itself and Delta saw it had legs and feet. Fancy black shoes that looked nice until she saw that they didn't have a lace or show a buckle. They seamlessly merged straight into the black snacks as the figure continued to be lowered. The form remained shrouded by the deep green mist. Ladies and gents, both and neither, and of course all of the above, I welcome you tonight to the unveiling of a star reborn. The mighty has become mightier, the sexy became sexier. We avoid looking right at the star if you have a weak heart. Delta Dungeon Inc. is not liable for any medical issues sustained and staring right at Monsoir Maestro. 
the figure said proudly. Delta held her breath wondering if the princely gentleman that had been born from Maestro would soon grace them. Maestro touched down and Delta went pale, going limp and silent at the creature before her. The white shirt and dinner jacket with the beautiful red mushrooms in the jacket pocket was nice, but everything shoulder up was a nightmare. He flexed his wicked long fingers and now his black tips and gripped the cane as he walked forward, his mass of roots trailing behind him and life support. His mushroom cap had remained and the odd hair inside trailed down his back and the sleek black neatness. His face had two wide, deep holes with dark red lights that gleamed like twin fires in the dark, much like a creature luring an unwary to a quick death. At odd times, his inner glow filled both eyes, all jumped between one to the other like a demented tennis ball, while his opened his mouth was wide with spiky, wormy tongue and like tiny holes all around it. His jaw was rigid, with needle-like teeth that stood where his lips should be, and each one gave off a high note as if they moved independently of each other like a centipede's legs. That was when her four other limbs emerged from his back and showed tiny snapping mushrooms' heads at each end. Each had the same black as his jacket. Delta suddenly got up before excusing herself, walking calmly down the stone steps for a moment. Oh, she's getting emotional. Mushy, isn't this super? Maestro gushed at the lovely voice of his. Well, he wasn't wrong. Delta closed her eyes, focused and reached out to feel the joy of life that was Maestro, the monster that she had known and regularly sang songs with. It was still him and she forced herself to open up her eyes and march back up the stairs. She faltered as Maestro's red eyes, expectant smile, God, those teeth, and she moved jerkily forward like a zombie with arthritis. She raised her head to meet those red eyes. Sing a song for me, she pleaded. Maestro bowed with much grace, and she felt like a peasant. Worse was when all of the extra limbs' heads bowed as well. Shall I go into a familiar clubs, or shall I spruce your heart up and ears with a hidden carabarets and secret ballrooms? He smiled. Surprise me, she squeaked, and glared at Mushy, who was hiding deep chuckle. The thumping beat was followed by a long draw of the piano. As Maestro slid all the way down his stone temple onto the edges, moving at an impossible angles, each piano note seemed to light up a step as Maestro passed it. The red steps, blue steps, flashing neon green steps. One step would just blink hot pink, and Delta tried not to look at the one Maestro tapped his foot. Every mushroom on the room, every mushy, began to sway at his step like a dance routine that they had all practiced. Drums, Maestro commanded, and the walls itself pulsed with a playful boom. Then he turned to the roof. Strings. He flicked a long clawed hand at a hidden spiderweb, began to twang and twing. He gave a mighty bow, and the stairs lined with mushrooms, and the stairs just slid down. Percussion, backup choir, if you do please. He grinned, and the nightmarish image was only a little better to deal with after this third sight. The mushrooms stored by species began to hum along to the beat, and some echoed with instruments. Delta giggled, a little as each of them was still doing a little jig to Maestro's beat. There is a sweet little girl, a little pal of you and me. You may know her as Delta, a sweeter princess than your Cinderella. Maestro crooned as he began to climb up the steps one at a time. Each step began to flash exotically at his foot. Delta felt herself flash as she was laughing now. Soon, she was pulled into a swing by Lord Mushy and Delta ended up forgetting to be scared as the song played on. Ruli watched as her mum swung her red sword. It barely made a dent in the table when she tried to put effort into a swing. The thing must be demon friendly or it just doesn't like me. Mila huffed and placed the weapon back on the table. I can't imagine how. Magma is such a sweet thing, Ruli answered, and she shoved the old cheese on the bread to her mother. Mila hit her on the back of the head. The sword has as sharp as your humor, the woman said gruffly. Ruli reached for the blade and was cut off when Mila spoke. If you cut my table and make a point, I will hunt you, she said calmly. Ruli decided to reach for another sandwich instead. Well, I can confirm it's demons made. Feels like the knife your father once showed me. Mila sighed. Ruli frowned, trying to remember the story, but came up with nothing. 
We were not hating each other. Well, I wasn't hating him, and in the middle of some romance. He threw up a dagger on me. He claimed he was stabbed earlier, but forgot to remove the blade, and he saw his body had taken a natural action. I accused him of being an immature demon man-child, and left, Miller explained. First off, ew. You're old, and you don't need bromance. Second, do you still have that blade? Rudy asked and her mother snorted. Lost it when I stabbed the royal knight, who called me Demon Whore. Somewhere between his third and fourth rib, I think. Mila smiled at the memory. I'm lucky to be as normal as I am, Rudy mumbled. Magma glowed, and her cheese sandwich became cheese toasty. Oh, the mighty cooking sword. I heard the mystical single tool of the sagely kitchen was lost. Didn't know that I'd found it. She grinned and devoured her sizzling cheese snack. That was a rolling pin, and I was found in some stupid cooking tournament, where the food literally had to be bad for causing inappropriate reactions with people. Mila sipped her coffee and thought about it. I heard that it had been corrupted after being used to club an ogre's heads in. But that info is that hard to confirm. She added, shrugging. Well, my sword toast stings. What does your sword do? Rudy taunted, feeling cheesy like she was ten again. Her mother snorted and gestured to the room. Which one? I've got so many and I end up finding one in an unused sock drawer. I swear, I found my slicing heaven spear when I went looking for my spare broom. The older woman shook her head. Rudy smirked. Broomstick flying was outlawed due to littering by the king. She said, and was hit again by a book that her mother had thrown. Rude child, came the old retort. The book easily missed her, and Rudy's mother hadn't aimed at her, but just threw it to warn her. Rudy caught the book and flipped through the old pictures taken with a memory stone and sketcher. Cheap ones could only do black and white while coming out grainy. Rudy was surprised to see crisp, colorful pictures that spoke of a good model stone. The downside to the stones over the huge, unwieldy cameras that were slowly being brought into creation by smarter people than Rudy was that the memory sketcher couldn't sketch the person themselves since the memory would be the first person. But until these cameras could do more than just one picture every 10 minutes and didn't need chemicals and brew to work, people would use the stones. Pictures from her mother's view were flipped through. It was obvious to see which memories were close compared to the hazy ones that came out half-suggested and sometimes white in places. Memory stones were too easily misled like that. Memories half-formed were never right, and people could swap in really vivid imaginations over memories making them pointless in any court. Ruli blinked. Damn, Mr. Jones is haunting me, she whispered, trying to empty her head of pointless knowledge, like that to make room for beer later. She slowed her picture of the three men, a rather goofy young Haldy, a strong glaring pick, and a towering man who beamed at her mother with such an earnest feeling that the space around the man's face was a little blurry, as if Mila almost didn't remember it right, or avoided it for too long. The picture had a neat writing underneath it. Me and the idiots, and I would die for them all if I don't kill them first. Rudy read and Mila snorted. True words were never spoken, she agreed. You never told me about how you lot ended up here, you know. Rudy said quietly. Mila chopped some vegetables in quick efficiency. Mila took time to mull over the words over and over. Would you believe it all that started with hunting some horned rabbits? She said dryly. Rudy gave her a long look. Horned rabbits are made up. Their biology sucks so much to be real. It's like centaurs. If you think too much about it, rabbits with anywhere near long enough horns could ever burrow or eat properly. Rudy argued. Mila pointed to the kitchen knife to add a daughter. You're welcome. I helped wipe out those mistakes of nature, she agreed. So, getting rabbits led to you making a town. Rudy frowned. Mila pushed her grey hair back, and her yellow eyes blinked once slightly. In a sense, me and my idiots ended up being kind of successful and a little bit famous. We were recruited to the knights, and we laughed the offer off, and we, recruiter, ended up sticking around for drinks. That damn porter loves their booze. Mila snorted at the memory. Rudy began to wipe down magma with a well-used cloth. The sword was warm to the touch, but Rudy knew that it could burn her fingers to the bone at any second. It was like a wild animal who took a liking to Rudy. 
Well, the recruiter had some personal issues and we ended up meeting some creeps who tried to kill the recruiter. We barely blinked and they were dead. Law Pinky, that's my name for them, was strong. I was impressed, so I tried to smash her face in for the hell of it. Mila scrapped her cutting board into a broiling stew. I woke up three days later and Pinky was still around. I was bundled into the back of our wagon and covered in a blanket. I could have died from an infection or bleeding or out of boredom. Whatever, but Pinky had a talent for keeping people just barely alive. Mila said calmly, as if not speaking about her near death. Well, one thing led to another and we ended up here. Mila said and slammed the pot lid on a stew. Rudy gave her a long look. I think you skipped a few pages due to your old age, she said kindly. The air dropped in temperature. Well, I guess that's the story for now. Now will you stop your damn sword that's melting my table? She asked bluntly. Rudy looked down to see the magma sinking into the wooden table like a hot blade in butter. Bad sword. Melting is for flesh of the enemies and toast. She sighed and yanked the blade out of the wood and the wet noise. Now the stew will be about another hour before it's right. You can go run errands for me. Mila said and Rudy stared at her. Excuse me, I'm not your bronze one errand girl, eager for some coppers and a bottle of sink water for a reward. Rudy stood to leave. Shame, I was going to throw in dessert and a bottle of my 55-year-old ogre whiskey. Oddly, the same ogres that might have been clubbed that I had mentioned before. Mina's voice froze Rudy's leg, and she tried to overpower the temptation. Having to bribe your own daughter is pretty bad on your parenting, Rudy said between clenched teeth. Mila snorted. Bribing your kids is parenting 101. It was taking you out and hunting gold rank beasts. That was bad parenting part. Her mother said dryly. I actually liked that bit, Rudy said, and turned back to her mother, who had a list of requests. Elder duties go on despite rain, snow, and recently falling spider parts, Mina smirked. Rudy glared at the mundane tasks. Elders go on despite age, time, and reason, she muttered. The first task was simple. Collect five yellow flowers and blue leaves and deliver them to Mr. Dabagast. This is demeaning, Rudy informed her mother. This is having a mother and a sweet tooth, came her curt reply. Rudy really couldn't argue with that. Dad would have let me kill a ten-foot demon eating plants for this sap. She tried going for the oldest weapon in her arsenal. Your father would have had an army following you and warned the plants that if they had harmed you, he'd make them into chairs and give them to the glutton demons for the stress testing. Now go. Her mother waved a spoon at her. Rudy's expression was sour and she left the cottage. She made it to the road and let out heart of durance. Between being imprisoned by Mr. Jones and beating up the army in the dungeon, Rudy hadn't really taken a look at her home. Her red eyes traced patches of flowers that were springing up. The sounds of songbirds seemed distant, but faintly coming closer. The air smelled clean, and for the first time in ages, the weather wasn't mundane, pleasant, and it looked like it might actually rain. Dungeon Manor was invasive, and depending on what dungeon you lived nearby, different things would happen. Delta had made things come to life like before, but there was something just a little different. Rudy couldn't quite put a finger on it. A bee the size of an apple wandered nearby and gathered some pollen before floating off with a merry buzz. Rudy gave it a long look. Dungeons were supposed to make monsters appear nearby or horrible mutants. Delta just made happy bees, she snorted. Still, she might need to warn Kuss that things might be a bit weirder. She kept an eye out, and after ten minutes in the field, she found the flower that she was looking for. Ruli was sure that it was the right flower, but it seemed to be double the size of the average kind. Ruli decided that in case that she should only have to gather half the amount then. She whistled, and Magma easily removed the plant. After this, Ruli had to go collect ten crabs from the river, and then fetch just sturdy branches with no reason that Ruli could see. It was sad that the bronze rank folks lived for this kind of work. She looked up to see someone heading towards the other's place with an apron on and a defeated posture. Wait until they saw the bar. That'd cheer them up. Excuse me, I need a shift here. Please, please don't be angry, Shy Nina asked as the webs around five feet away from the room entrance. The webs parted like curtains and Nina dashed through, covering her head as she ran into the wall in her haste. She bounced back and stumbled through the actual door. 
The spider caught all she had a look, and one holding the tripwire slowly down, climbed back up. Th -th thank you, Shinina said, and faintly as she walked on, staggering from the blow. Queen Dreamweaver III decreed that extra webbing would be used to soften the wall in the future. There was a customary vote dance where they all agreed, and then the celebration dance was passing the vote. Shinina didn't see this, and she took a small seat in the pond room. Owie. She held a bump on her head. Why couldn't Lazy Nina go? All paranoid Nina. Why me? She sniffed. Gruff Nina told her why. Because out of the Ninas to form, she was the least likely to cause more trouble for Miss Vera. There was something black in front of her, and she pulled her legs up in the rock, and the duck stared up at her. Shy Nina didn't have great memory, so she, the original trip down was a little hazy, after the great split in the bar. That they met this thing before. Shoo, please don't bite me. I don't have bread, Shy Nina whispered. The duck gave her a long, piercing look. Nina retreated into her safe ball a bit more, her face almost hidden behind her knees. A quack once and waddled off before turning back to stare at her. Shy Nina was feeling it was waiting for her. Shy Nina wasn't sure whether she should follow a random duck. Quack. The duck said firmly, and Shy Nina shrieked and jogged up to catch. I'm sorry, she bowed her head, and the duck walked off and led her down the hallway, away from the mud pit. The duck led in into a room of many shells. It looked like a dead end, and Shy Nina gave the oddest snoozing mouse inside a bowl of jelly a long look. Then mouse gave her a bad vibe. The duck approached the back wall and opened it on its own accord. The air flowing out of this dark space was hot and made her senses grow a bit hazy. She wandered in as the duck turned once more and red eyes had gone, a little softer. Mwah. The duck assured her. Shy Nina had gone mad and her madness was a duck in a dungeon. Well, after the calm monster, which all Ninas remembered quite clearly, how bad could this tunnel be? She walked for some time and an odd mist began to curl around her feet. The heat seemed to seep into her body and she soon stood up before a stone building of some sort. I dare to say that today is a good day to be you. You come, my little maiden, to see the fabulous rising star in action. Come close and see the debut like no other. The man seemed to call from the top. Nina could handle this. It wasn't so bad. She took a step forward, sleeves covering her face, and she neared the stranger. He took a few steps down, and he seemed to have a thick vines attached to him. Or roots. The mist thinned, and the walk down with a cane in hand. Shy Nina's body went rigid, and the eye bounced between eye holes. The odd hat that she thought was wool was part of his head, and then the rip of his face opened and the dancing needle legs. Shy Nina fell back and landed hard on her rear as she stared. Eyes wide as her mind turned itself off to protect itself. Starstruck, I can hardly blame you. Welcome to the number one dungeon in the land. I shall be your man of the hour, Mansoir, maestro. The thing bowed and Shy Nina turned and saw the duck was gone. P -p please she stumbled on the verge of tears. The monster leaned down and it looked demonic in its nature. It went for her and Shy Nina prayed it would be quick. She felt something light pressed into her hands, and she looked down at it. It was a bizarre piece of pottery with the words, I met Maestro, stamped on the side with an elegant penmanship. You need not beg or look so happy with tears. Of course, you can have my autograph. The man said cheerfully and pulled her to her feet. My brother made the pot, and I have yet to ask for the paper and ink from mother. But she has ever so busy sometimes. The creature nodded. It spoke and those needle lips clicked and twanged with music notes as if the insects were conducting from inside. Shy Nina forced a question out. N -n Need work, Vera? She gasped out. Maybe if she was under Vera's protection, she would be safe. The man pressed her forward and with the strength and strong enough that she was actually lifted off the ground, almost gliding across the ground. Ah, yes, the lovely last did mention hiring an outsider. A very juicy gossip. Well, all so excited. The thing Maestro said and leaned down. Shy Nina nearly broke into tears at being so near his face. Mother will take care of you. She is very fond of people, and if anyone gives you hassle, you tell Maestro here, and I'll bring down the wrath of the likes never seen or heard of before. 
or I shall tell my brother and stand smugly at the side as he lectures them, he said hurriedly. Shainina felt the crushing her body would be too easy for Maestro and his mist. It seemed to come from his body like an aura, and it made things hazy in the Shainina's head. For your first shift I shall dedicate the music for tonight to your effort. What blues sing to you? What pop makes you bob? Tell Maestro the wonderful, what music sings to your soul? He pressed and had her in one armed hug. It was so sudden a question, Shai Ninsa just answered it. I like orchestra, she said and covered her mouth in horror. The demon man's face broke into something that had to be a smile. That smile was going to be in Shai Nina's nightmares for many days to come. She'll be fine. Maestro is not that bad once she stopped looking at him head on. Daza promised Renny. The mime gave her a black smile that tore open his face. Yeah, sorry. After Maestro, you're downright handsome, she said dryly. Renny dropped the grin in a huff but gestured curiously at the circus before them. I'm taking a day off from battling the forces of evil and unspeakable horror to decorate, she explained. She opened a menu and browsed the options. I'll share what I can do and see if we can make it closer to your home. She offered him the mime looked away for a moment at the statue of his father before he nodded. Circus, the act of a lifeline and afterlife. A circus left underground and fallen into disrepair. The echoes of good times and bad times can still be felt. Available options. Skeleton clowns and performers. Ten skeletons in clown costumes and other dress will become a low act and basic workers of the circus. This option was unlocked after absorbing skeletons and the slime lab. Here these workers have no intelligence or attack power to speak of. DP-20. Strong nets and ropes of various acts, made from spun spider silk and woven by spiders. These threads offer the best safety net and rope swings 5DP. Food station had a connection to the bar system to allow food stand just outside to sell popcorn, low quality, and various fruits and drinks made of jungle. Increased food and all of the other floors connected to the system. 20 DP. Ticketmaster, Queenie, allow a rare monster Queenie to open his gates to allow ticket owners to pass without issues from his tunnel that connects to the outside. Tickets may be purchased from Queenie as well. 25 DP. Create a performer on stage to allow Maestro of the first floor to appear in this place. His job will become Code Ringmaster. Able to promote shows, create music, and capture the audience's attention. His form will be hidden behind a screen for the sake of the audience. 25 DP. When the show is happening, promote Rennie to Ringstar. His class will change and he will regain a new abilities until the end of the show. The more successful the circus is, the more power Rennie will have overall. 30 DP. Delta read out these options and Rennie gave her a long look. His features didn't move, but he held up the finger, and then no more. First option, or one at a time, so that we can see how it goes. She inquired, Rennie motioned to the second option. Delta grinned, eager to see how this would turn out. Dungeons could have deadly traps or godly monsters. Delta had a circus, and thus she won by default. She purchased the skeleton crew. There was a slight rumble and Delta looked around to see if she could see the monsters forming, or more likely, the skeletons would be considered critters and not true monsters. Then, as if in unison, ten bony hands broke through the ground. Rennie walked over, hands splayed, as if commanding them to rise. Nearby, Maestro's mushrooms began to tremble with the tune. Oh my god, she whispered, and the skeletons rose in various dirty articles of clown dress and loose leotards. They stood in a rough triangle formation and many flexed his fingers, like casting a fishing line, and each of the bone creatures began to stomp forward in time. Rennie, the circus is supposed to make people happy and delighted, not have nightmares, she cried as Rennie marched his warriors forward, their firm movements in time with the beat. Rennie waggled his finger. The mime is right, the circus is supposed to be unforgettable. The maestro laughed with delight. What kind of people want to visit a circus with dancing damned? She demanded out loud. Von frowned as he recounted the coins. The vampire banker was not happy. People coming to the town meant the easy job of counting money that never changed was now becoming a pain. He might need to make a go for this soon. 
All of this manner in the air was making him peckish, but he had made an agreement with Mila. Von was good, but Mila was, well... Von didn't like the word fear. It didn't quite explain things. Admired cautiously would be better suited. Still, a man had needs. Before when manner was low, his powers barely needed food. Now he was itchy. He could fly to the capital and grab food, but those nights were so bothersome. He tapped a finger on his chin. Durrance was off limits. The capital was annoying. Von needed more than one's average blood. The problem of being old enough to have been around before some mountains was that the body tended to need a bit of more spices than his meals. He opened the drawer and pulled out a contact book and addresses and dates. Regal? Oh, he was beheaded a few years back. Never understood why he loved cows. Lily vanished into the ocean after climate change. That she didn't believe in. A road in her cliff. Good riddance. One returned the page. Edmund, his creepy and stalks teenage girls, reported him ages ago. Roger would help, but I don't think that I know where he is. Desiree was staked on her own dancer pole. Hamish got lost in a castle and then it collapsed. Morian went on a vacation into the abyss. Lucky woman. Jolene was killed after she took a summons man. I swear a vampires are dying breed, he sighed. He paused at a name. Sarah. Now that's a pity case that I haven't thought of in years. I wonder if she ever got those mirrors working. Her castle could be beyond the capital and in the woods. Well, it was either her or crazy vegan Victor. And I don't know how he turns trees into ghouls, and I don't want any part of it. He slammed the book shut. Mr. Bond got his hat, his coat, and his apprentice. He had trapped in the basement to fight some rats. Master, they're bigger than horses! She screamed from below. He merely looked down at her. I still hear you chittering. Kill at least two more and I'll let you out, he said kindly. He went to make some calls. End of chapter. That, my friends, concludes this episode. I hope that you enjoyed. If you wish to support the author of the story, there will be a link below. If you wish to support this channel, there are multiple ways to do so, which will all also be linked below. But the easiest way would be to subscribe and share my videos as much as possible. And until next time, I hope you all have a good one. And I'll see you all in the next video. Cheers.